everyone needs to grow. And without growth, we can't walk with the Word. Hello everyone, I'm Jonathan Burns and thank you so much for joining me on Walking with the Word. This is just a simple program to get you and to get me to take our Bibles, open them up, and spend some time thinking about some things that we can take with us all throughout our week together. Now today we're looking at a lesson entitled, How to Grow in the Lord. What I want to do is I want to give you six avenues of growth as we walk through the Word together. Now to do this, I want to share with you 10 different things. I know that's 16 things, but these things will help us build a standard to set us on the same plane. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to share with you a slide. It's going to come on your screen here in just a moment, and it's going to have 10 different events. And we're going to look at all the places that are there, see all the references, see what took place, and we're going to make one solid note about those things that we see. Now what you may want to do is you may want to take a screenshot of this or maybe pause this video and write these things down in some way so you can look at these things at your own pace because we're going to go through them rapidly. Acts 2.48, Acts 8.12, Acts 8.13, Acts 8.38, Acts 9.18, Acts 10.48, Acts 16.15, Acts 16.33, Acts 18.8, and Acts 19.5. Here we have Jerusalem, Samaria, Judea, Damascus, Caesarea, Philippi, Corinth, and Ephesus. Ten different cases. Now listen to these descriptions. About 3,000 souls were added to them. Both men and women were baptized. Simon believed and was baptized. The Ethiopian eunuch was baptized. Saul, who we know as Paul, was baptized. Cornelius and all his house were baptized. Lydia and her household there were baptized. The jailer and his household were baptized. The Corinthians believed and were baptized. And these people in Ephesus were baptized in the name of the Lord. The, the question today is, how do we grow in the Lord? Well, number one, we need to be in the Lord. The book of Acts records all sorts of occasions where men and women both hear a message, hear a message, follow that message, and we see every one of them is baptized Every one of them is saved. Every one of them has joy and rejoices. How do you grow in the Lord? Here's number one. You've got to get in the Lord. Now some will tell you, just pray this prayer. The concept or the idea of a prayer of salvation is never found in Scripture. Neither in recorded form of a prayer or never is it found where someone said a prayer and was saved. Some will say, well, you just got to, you just got to love the Lord. You got to believe the Lord. The demons believe and they tremble, but they were not saved. Now, I'm not calling you a demon, but I am telling you and I'm telling myself, if I want to be saved, I've got to hear a message and obey that message and that culminates with my repentance of my sins, my confession of Jesus and who He is, and my immersion, my baptism, to be saved. How do we grow in the Lord? Let's find six avenues once we are in the Lord in how we can grow. I want to give you six words. Time, opportunity, attitude, work, talk, attendance. Maybe the last one bothers you, but hold with me when we get there and let's see something that pulls all of this together. Let's talk about time. Go with me to Acts chapter 20, and I want you to notice in Acts chapter 20, verses 7 through 8. Now on the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul, ready to part on the next day, spoke to them, and they continued his message until midnight. There were many lamps in the upper room, where they were gathered together. I want you to focus on that last phrase there, where they were gathered together. 
We notice in the first phrase of Acts 27 through 8, now on the first day of the week, we see the day of which they've gathered together. They have come together on the first day, Sunday, the first day of the week. They were the disciples. They came together to break bread and Paul ready to depart. He spoke till midnight. It's not the midnight part I want you to focus on. It's all the peripherals here. They came together on the first day of the week. Came together. They broke bread together. There was preaching in this particular occasion. We don't know all the things that took place there, but here are some of the things. They were in an upper room and there were many lamps gathered as they gathered together. You and I, what we need to do, if we want to grow in the Lord, we need to take time to be together. Now I want to do this in two different avenues and two different ways locations. We need to, number one, learn to grow together, together. What I mean by that is, let's come to worship. We'll talk about attendance later, and I'm going to use a phraseology there that might be different than what most will use, but let's come together. Let's desire to be together. Let's long to be together in the church building. Now, the church building is not the church. It's just where the church gathers. Let's desire to be together. Let's have all the peripherals taken care of. They came together. They had their bread. They had their lamps. They had everything there. Paul had the message. Let's come together with everything put together. Let's not haphazardly walk into worship or Bible study on accident. Let's come together in the church building to worship, to study. Let's also come together in the church building just to be together. Every time we assemble together, and what I mean by that is every time we go to the church building, we don't have to have a Bible class or a period of worship. Now, we certainly need to have those. Don't hear me. I'm not saying we should cancel all our services and only have one, but we should have times where we come together here. Number one, because the greatest waste of a church building is an empty church building. So we should use our facility to come together with worship and for the fun things that we love. But number two, you see this in the first century church. They came together from house to house. Let's be together in our homes to study and to enjoy one another's company. And guess what? That takes time. Not only that, we have an opportunity. James 1 21 and 22. Therefore lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls but be doers of the word and not hearers only deceiving yourselves. Let's be people who take the opportunity to do what the book says. We say that we are people of the book. I'm going to ask you one question and this point is yours. Are we? Are we actually people of the book? That's a question that you and I will have to answer on our own. You see, we have time, we have opportunity, we have attitude. Maybe this is a big one for us, but 2 Peter 1, 5 through 7 describes some attitudes and actions that we need to have in our lives. But also, for this very reason, Giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, to virtue knowledge, to knowledge self-control, to self-control perseverance, to perseverance godliness, to godliness brotherly kindness, and brotherly kindness love. Why did Peter write to these folks about adding these things in? Because sometimes our attitudes are wrong. And all these things here, listen, in 2 Peter 1, 5 through 7, if we'll give virtue to our faith, Respect it. If we'll give knowledge to our lives, follow it. If we'll give self-control when I need to abstain and refrain and change, I will. Let's give perseverance. I've got to keep going because, listen, I know our world's not out to get us individually, but the world itself, as in the world that doesn't love God, doesn't love you. And that's hard, but think about this in perseverance. Sometimes it's hard to be a Christian. Godliness, God-livingness, kindness, love. These are attitudes. And it starts right here to put all these things together. And it comes from an implanted word of which we can follow. Something we can have, something that we can do, something that we can be. Our attitudes carry us through. 
Matter of fact, I'll suggest to you our attitudes carry us over to our work, Titus 2, 11 through 13. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present age, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Jesus is coming again. He's coming to bring all to judgment. But greater than that, he's coming to take his kingdom home, his people home. And that means I've got to work while it is day. There comes a time when no man can work. Salvation has appeared to all men, and it teaches us that there's something I've got to do, denying ungodliness and worldly lust. Everything mankind needs can be found in the places where God has put them. Our world wants us to have them wherever we want, make ourselves happy, but that's not the work that you and I need to follow after. That's not what we do, not because it's what I think, but because you and I can pick up this book. Now we're remembering that chart at the beginning, those 10 things. They heard a message and then they did it. There's a work that we must do. So let me give you something to talk about. I want you to think about 2 Timothy 2, 1 and 2. Now, this I think is one of the most impactful statements to ministry because Paul is writing to his son in the faith, Timothy, and he's reminding him of something that, that I need to know and you need to know. You therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things that you have heard from me among many witnesses, commit these things to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Timothy, just tell it like it is. Don't change the message. Don't change anything. You've got something to talk about. And therefore, we understand we need to be able to, if we're going to grow in our faith and grow in the Lord, I've got to learn to be able to talk about Christ to others. That's complicated in our world. But here's what I know. You know somebody today of whom you can go and say, hey, come to church with me. I'll pick you up and then we'll go to lunch and let's have a great day together. And then that lunch can be filled with whatever's going on in that Sunday morning assembly or Sunday night assembly or Sunday night, maybe have a dinner, a Wednesday night. I'll take you to dinner. We all can do that. We can say, hey, just, just come with me. And then we can talk about it. Because we, we, we can focus. Let's talk about that last word that's kind of looming over us, attendance. Think about Romans 14, 19. Therefore, let us pursue the things which make for peace and the things by which one may edify another. I want you to look at that verse. And I want you to see it. And I want myself to know and I want you to know, unless we come together, we cannot pursue peace and we cannot edify one another. And I know we can call one another. I know we can help one another. But unless the church assembles together, the church cannot function. That's, that's less about your attendance and more about your love for someone else. That's less about your attendance and more about your compassion to someone else. That's less about your attendance and more about your care for someone else. Just imagine if Jesus was absent from the cross. There would be no cross. And therefore, we have the opportunity to pursue one another for peace and for edification. You see, what we're trying to do is we're trying to grow in the Lord. Now, those six things that I've listed, those ten things in the beginning where people heard God's Word, and those six things where characteristics and attitudes and attributes were built, they're not the only things that we can do. But here are six that we can work on. And if we'll take them, we'll add them to our lives, 
we can be people who walk with the Word every day of our lives.